UK Prime Minister Liz Truss has just held talks with the country's independent fiscal watchdog after criticism of her government's tax-cutting plans. The Office for Budget Responsibility has confirmed that it could have produced a draft economic forecast in time for the so-called mini-budget last week, but the Chancellor, it says, didn't ask for one. That decision has been blamed in part for turmoil on financial markets, and therefore that meeting with the OBR came announced by number 10 Downing Street for Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. And it was just hours after the opposition Labour Party surged to a 33-point lead over the governing Conservatives, according to a poll by YouGov. That is a record share for Labour in any YouGov poll, the highest figure the party's ever recorded in any published survey since the late 1990s. UK Prime Minister Liz Truss has defended her controversial plan to try and reignite economic growth with huge tax cuts. That initially hammered the value of the pound and government bond prices. Sterling has now recovered to levels seen before that so-called mini-budget, but nerves remain on financial markets. Let's talk now to Nigel Fletcher, political historian at King's College London. And Nigel, a political historian, is exactly the person we want to give us the context of that polling that we saw from YouGov overnight. What does it mean? Well, I think it's fair to say that it's historically bad for the government and for the Conservatives. Um, It is, uh, I think, the YouGov poll, which was um, one of the ones which showed such an extraordinary lead for Labour. It was the highest they've ever recorded in the history of that company. Um, So these are historically bad numbers um, for the Conservatives. Um, But I think it's taken a lot of people um, by surprise how quickly this does seem to have politically unravelled for Liz Truss. We have to bear in mind she's only been in office for less than a month. Usually we would expect a new prime minister to have some kind of honeymoon with the electorate as people uh, perhaps reacted to something a bit different. Boris Johnson, of course, her predecessor, was himself very unpopular. Um, And so the the thinking, I think, was that uh, whoever took over, there would be a bump in the polls from uh, the Conservatives. But um, I think this is um, a sign of um, a government that uh, wants to get on and and do something um, very dramatic. Um, and certainly, I think uh, if that was their aim, they, they've certainly achieved that, but perhaps not in the way that they wanted to. And, and just on that polling that you were taking us through, what would that mean? I mean, all the usual caveats apply, but what would that mean if there was a general election around now and those polls were borne out? Well, um, there are some uh, estimates, if you put these raw numbers into some of the the, the modelling software on on various websites, um, some people have been having um, uh, a lot of fun putting those in and saying that it would result in there being no Conservatives in the House of Commons or or just two or three. Um, I think even on these numbers, I think, uh, as you say, the caveats would would apply. We would expect uh, some kind of tightening towards any general election, which, of course, is is now two years away. We would expect those numbers to perhaps um, tighten during the course of the vote to an election anyway. Um, but also um, putting a national uh, opinion poll share into those kind of um, databases, increasingly that is less useful because there is a lot of regional variation in how people vote. Uh, there are some areas where the Conservatives rack up huge amounts of votes and some places where Labour racks up huge amounts of votes. It's not evenly distributed throughout the country. So putting those raw numbers into a database and saying that, you know, this means the Conservatives will be wiped out. Um, I think, uh, as, as Peter Snow used to say on, on BBC um, election nights, just a bit of fun. But certainly, I think we shouldn't underestimate that on, on the basis of these numbers, it's a, the Conservatives are looking at a, a, a landslide defeat uh, of the scale um, of the 1997 general election or even worse at this point. Um, So we'll have to see what happens in the next two years. Well, indeed, what is Liz Truss's way out of this uh, conundrum, if indeed there is one? Well, that's really the key question. And I think lots of people will be looking to her speech in uh, Birmingham next week at the the Conservative Party conference for any sign of how she's going to respond to this, uh, this issue whether she is going to, as she did in her interviews yesterday, whether she's going to double down and say there is, as far as she's concerned, no problem uh, with her approach and that all of these issues are external to the government, which is the position that she and the Chancellor have taken, or whether 
uh, in the, the face of quite a lot of uh, commentary and, and opposition from her own backbenchers, a lot of nervousness, understandably, um, whether in the face of that she will signal uh, some uh, form of concession. And I think that's really what we're, we're all waiting for. Um, I don't know whether we're going to expect any um, statement after the OBR meeting. We may, may already have had it, I don't know. But um, the outcome of that, it, it, it seems, um, perhaps is, is less likely to be a, a big intervention. But the conference in Birmingham next week is going to be extremely interesting. There'll be a lot of very worried and very unhappy Conservatives there. Um, and a new Prime Minister who would normally be expecting uh, to, to meet the conference uh, in a, a mood of triumph as the new leader is going to have to uh, set out how she is going to, to respond to what is, uh, in, in certainly in, in political terms, uh, a crisis for the Conservative Party. Well, that OBR meeting and its upcoming reports become critical, don't they? Because if the OBR is telling the Chancellor and the Prime Minister that the forecasts for revenue uh, and that kind of thing uh, and the UK economy's growth prospects are very, very difficult indeed, that has a direct effect on how much money they can spend or have to borrow. And so is there a sense in which the OBR has become incredibly important in exactly what the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are able to do next? And if so, please explain how. Yes, I think it is. And it's, uh, it's interesting that the OBR that was set up um, by George Osborne when he was uh, Chancellor um, is now playing such a central role. And I think that the, the decision by the Chancellor not to publish an OBR uh, forecast alongside his budget, uh, that has caused them huge problems. And I think that's what we're seeing reflected today, a week on uh, with this meeting. Um, in the past, when uh, chancellors made budget statements and, and fiscal announcements, uh, you would have a lot of commentary from sort of expert um, economists, many of whom would disagree with one another. Um, and in the UK, we, we, we became well used to um, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, an independent body, uh, providing their own um, analysis and commentary the day after the budget, which um, had a lot of credibility. Um, what George Osborne did was make that a formal um, institution of, of government. Um, and that has, I think, grown in its role um, and is seen by the markets and, and by uh, politicians as being um, the, the, the sort of neutral arbiter in, in, in sort of the analysis of, uh, of, of budgets uh, that governments put out. So I think you're right. They have certainly taken on in the context of what we're seeing with this huge, huge turmoil in the markets, uh, a very important role. What they come out with, uh, any statement they make or any analysis that they publish, uh, has added significance now because it will, as you say, have direct impact um, on uh, the, the markets and how much um, the government is able to uh, to manoeuvre its way out of a very difficult situation. Nigel, thank you. That's Nigel Fletcher, political historian at King's College London.